Hello and welcome to worship on this first Sunday, second Sunday of Easter. Uh, you probably don't know me, I better introduce myself. My name is Mike Wood, I'm a local preacher from Romsey Methodist Church. I have actually preached at St Andrews once before, uh, some years ago, when just after we joined uh, with your circuit. Um, my hair was a bit shorter then, but uh, <laughs> it would be nice if we could all get a haircut. So to begin our worship, let's pray. Let's come to God in prayer with an opening prayer. As we remember that uh, Easter is not just something that happened last week, but is a continuing reality as we celebrate the risen Jesus. Sovereign God, we thank you for the realities of Easter, which we continue to celebrate today. Realities that make such a difference to life, the victory of good over evil, love over hate, life over death, the turning of weakness into strength, fear into courage, doubt into faith, a new beginning where it had seemed like the end, new hope where there had seemed despair, new confidence where there had been confusion. Teach us to live each day as your Easter people. Sovereign God, we thank you that Easter is not just about events long ago, but about life now. Not just about others, but about us. Not just about one thing, but everything. Teach us to live each day as your Easter people. Help us, we pray, to live each day in the light of Easter, with its joy bubbling up in our hearts, its laughter shining in our eyes, and its message always on our lips. So may others, seeing the difference it has made to us, discover the difference it can make for them. Teach us to live each day as your Easter people, to the glory of your name. Amen. And now we're going to listen to a hymn of praise. All heavens declare the glory of the risen Lord. Forever he will be the Lamb of 
Hi. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the All Age Craft Spot, where we take over your screens for about five, five minutes so we can get crafting. Welcome, welcome. Hello. First Sunday after Easter. Did you have a great time? Did you have a good Easter? Loads of chocolate. Did you do any craft activities? What about Sam's paper plate craft with the egg that splits open? How good was that? Okay, so what are we doing today? Pretty much all the Bible readings for today and all of this week are about unity. And that just means being together or standing together and being united. So that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Last weekend, we were thinking about how Jesus died for all our sins. And on Good Friday, after Jesus died, his followers were all huddled together and feeling really lost and afraid. But then he came back so that all who follow him will receive eternal life, which is amazing. We are all God's children. And this week we're really focusing on that because God doesn't make mistakes. We are all part of his kingdom. Amen. So we've been making paper people chains and drawing on them and colouring them in and really thinking about who they represent. We've got all the different skin tones that people can be and still be part of God's kingdom and there are more skin tones than we have pencils for. And some people aren't even all one colour. We're going to try. We've got boy shapes and we've got girl shapes and in between shapes and we're thinking about how some of our people might not always have been one shape or the other but now they are here and that's wonderful. Some of our people are in boy girl pairs and some of them are in pairs of the same gender or more than two some are on their own and it's all about God's amazing variety. A lot of our people have two arms and two legs and two eyes and ears and very much the standard shape. Some are bigger or smaller or have fewer limbs or working senses. Some might even have tools to help them get around or do things they want to do. Some people's minds work differently and it could make them super happy. But some people have emotions that can make them really sad. Some might be really clever and some might not be. Some people know loads of languages and others may never be able to speak or communicate at all. Some might even look exactly the same as somebody else, but they're still going to be completely different to each other on the inside, like with twins or multiples. You know when you're walking down the beach and you're picking up shells or stones and they're all completely unique? Well, so are we. People are amazing and God made us all perfectly fat or thin or tall or small or strong in different ways. Jesus died and came back for us all. So as you create your own paper people today and throughout the week, it's a lovely opportunity to think about what life might be for the person that you're making. And use that time to pray for people like the one you're working on. It's just a wonderful time to sit with God and try to picture all of the blessings on all of his people. So what are you going to do with your paper people when you've made them? Hmm? How are you going to be able to look at them and remember to pray for them again and again? And that's up to you. I've stuck some of my paper people to a picture of the world to remind me that we are not alone. And I made mine into a crown. William made a crown of God's handiwork and remembering that we are redeemed because of what Jesus did for us, that we are God's family. I did these. Olivia put hers in a ring, joining hands around the daffodils that we still have, that we got loads of to celebrate Easter with. I used some cotton thread to make some more of mine into a hanging decoration for the, for the kitchen. The kitchen is stuck on the fridge with magnets. So when you've made your paper people, show us what you've done by sending in a picture to the St Andrews Methodist Church Facebook page and maybe post one of your pictures in the comments under the link to this video. Remember, get in touch, get involved and stay excited. That's all from us this week. 
have a great one and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye bye. Today's reading is from John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 entitled Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you. After he said that he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thanks be to God. Fake news. It's a phrase we hear quite a lot of these days. I'm not sure if it started with Donald Trump or if it was before that. But anyway, we all hear about fake news. And nowadays it seems that opinions count for more than facts. Just a single newspaper article single Twitter feed, a, a Facebook thread. People seem to believe what they read without checking the facts. We've seen a recent example with this business of the blood clots uh, following the AstraZeneca vaccination. Now there's no evidence as far as I'm aware that the blood clots are a consequence of the vaccination but a lot of people believe it is and people have been scared from taking the vaccine. And then there's this business about the reticence of, of black people, we're told, taking up the vaccine. And we've had this business of Lenny Henry, a black comedian, having to go online or go on a video, trying to persuade them to be vaccinated. And then if you think back some years, there was that business of the MMR vaccine scare. Do you remember that? Uh, thousands of parents, allowed their children to go unprotected because of a single study which had shown that supposedly that there was a problem with the MMR vaccine. A single study, that was all, and it's now been shown to be false by further tests. But people believed it at the time. People can be very gullible. And then, of course, we've got all these conspiracy theories we hear about these days. And the extreme example we've seen in recent months, of course, came from America. This business about the election results being rigged. And before that, we had Obama was supposed to have not been born in America. And Hillary Clinton was a covert paedophile and so on. And then we've got this whole business of the QAnon conspiracy theory. And I shan't even bother to explain what all that's about. People believe what they want to believe. And you can see where I'm coming from with uh, our reading from Doubting Thomas today. But before I come on to that, let me just say as a scientist, I find this whole business particularly galling. Scientific theories are based on experimental evidence of repeatability. They have to be objective. Science papers are peer-reviewed before they're published. Of course, not all scientists are honest. And sometimes we do hear of cases where results have been rigged to fit in with preconceived theories. But fortunately, that's an exception. And the more remarkable the discovery is in, in science, the more it has to be rigorously tested by other research groups. Einstein's theory of relativity seemed so counterintuitive when it was first developed at the beginning of last century. And yet many tests have subsequently confirmed it to be true, and so we now believe it, because it has been shown by experimental evidence to be a correct description of the universe. 
So now let's come on to Thomas. And from what I've already said, I'm sure you'll <laughs> suspect that I have great sympathy with Thomas. After all, it was a pretty remarkable assertion that the other disciples had made that Jesus was alive, that he'd walked through a closed door. The resurrection wasn't expected despite hints from Jesus earlier on. They thought that his death was the end. They thought that that was it. All his work had been in vain and they were despondent and depressed. And now they're claiming that they have seen him alive. Oh, come on, pigs can fly. Thomas wouldn't believe it, neither would I. It's a tall story. And of course, perhaps uh, certain suggestions, certain explanations might spring to mind. It was a trick of the light. They were dreaming. Perhaps they'd been drinking. Perhaps it was just wishful thinking. No, Thomas wants proof. And he wants to be able to put his finger into the nail holes in Jesus's hands. And he wants to put his hand into his side where the sword had pierced him. He wants proof of such remarkable assertion as this, that Jesus is still alive. Can we blame him? I travel a lot to Australia. Well, at least I did before lockdown prevented it. I've got family in Sydney and we try to go every other year to see my children and grandchildren. And of course we fly in a, in a Boeing 747 or an Airbus 330, some large long haul flight. And I sit back and relax with confidence because I know that the aircraft has been rigorously tested. It's not just been cobbled together and okay, let's just have a go at it. From the prototype, the drawings on the drawing board, the manufacture, the testing, the maintenance, I know that this machine is reliable. And so I can sit back and relax. I have proof in effect that I can trust the machine to get me to my destination. You can't run the modern world without proofs, without tests. We crave certainty. Look at the vigorous testing of the various vaccines that have been brought out. Now, drugs take a lot of time to be tested and many years very often until they are proven safe. But those tests are very important and mercifully, we have been able to seal up the, speed up the process um, in the case of the COVID vaccines, but they have been tested and they have been shown to be safe. We expect that. Of course, some countries uh, want more rigorous tests than others. There's been some variability, but we do need assurance. We can't just rush into it without some sort of proof that these vaccines are going to be safe. And the bigger the risk that we take in life, the bigger we need to be more certain. Thomas is being asked to make a great leap of faith without proof, just to believe because the other disciples have said so. He's asked to have faith. What do we mean by Christian faith? Think back to John the Baptist's question when he was in prison. And he wants to know if Jesus really is the Messiah. So he sends people to ask him. And what does Jesus say? Does he say yes? Does he say no? He says neither of those things. He says, well, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor hear the good news, it's an indirect answer. He's in effect saying to John the Baptist, use your own eyes, you decide, you decide. 
And many questions in, in the Christian faith are, are not clear cut. And I think the message of the Gospels still leaves room for doubt. We're asked to have faith. Many Christians fear doubt because they think it will undermine faith. They fear to question. No, I don't agree. I think very often doubting can lead to further exploration, perhaps in new insights and then a deeper faith. I think God meant us to have doubts. Otherwise, he would have made his existence completely conclusive. Remember how Jesus was tempted by the devil to throw himself off the temple? Oh, good, that would be a stunt, wouldn't it? If you can throw yourself off the temple and survive, then people are bound to believe you. And then on the cross, people mocked him and said, Come on, if you are God's son, come down off the cross. Prove it to us that you are God's son. And then we will believe. Jesus declines. And why? Because faith is not engendered by facts. Of course, knowledge of fact is helpful and we have the Bible to read and help us in our way. But facts by themselves don't inspire faith. Let me just read you this little quote. I came across it years ago, a quote from W.F. Howard in a little book called The Christianity According to St. John. And he says this, a belief into which man is bludgeoned by some ocular demonstration, which leaves no course to but to submit, has none of the moral qualities of that faith which avails to the saving of the soul. Let me read that again. A belief into which man, or man or woman, of course, is bludgeoned by some ocular demonstration which leaves no cost but to submit has none of the moral qualities of that faith which avails to the saving of the soul. Faith is a necessary part of life. We can't always know the outcome of our actions. Our lives are constantly lived by little steps of faith. Let me take an example from say, perhaps marriage. Marriage perhaps is a, a step of faith which involves more trust than anything. And how do we go about it? Do we subject our potential partner to a battery of, of tests, of questions? What are your interests? What are your hobbies? What are your musical tastes? What sort of character do you have? What is your standing in the Myers-Briggs personality test? Will you be like your mother in 30 years time? No, I shouldn't have said that. Well, the dating agencies that flourish obviously believe that such evidence is, is useful. They have their algorithms to feed your information into so that they may come up with a good match. But I, for one, am not convinced that dating agencies are any more successful than the old fashioned way. An irrational basis based on that most irrational of emotions, love, love. That's how most of us make our decisions. And marriage is a journey of faith. Of course, alas, not all marriages are successful. But we take that first step, a step of faith in trust. And if we're Christians, perhaps we commit ourselves and our marriage to God and pray that it will be successful. So did Thomas get his proof? Well, yes and no. When he was confronted by Jesus, he forgot all about his business of putting his finger into the nail holes and his hand into his side. That all went by the board. He didn't ask as you might ask of a conjurer who's just taken a rabbit out of a hat or 
cut a woman in half. How did you do that? His response is, is very simple. He just says, my Lord and my God. <coughs> Excuse me. It's an emotional response as a consequence of his encounter with the risen Jesus. And Jesus, his statement is very significant because he says to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. And of course, that is where we are today. We're asked to believe without proof. We're asked to believe in faith. And that is perhaps the mystery of faith. We live our lives based on faith. We've tried the Christian way. We have tried following Jesus and we have found the way is not wanting. Not because we know, but because we trust in God. We trust in his love, in his constancy, in his reliability. And it is our faith, not our knowledge. It is our faith, which is our strength. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to bring our prayers to you. Prayers for your world, your church and your people. Father, we know that this virus does not respect borders. It spreads from place to place and person to person, impacting us globally. Oh, and it has brought so much grief, so much fear, so much death, so much isolation. So Father, we are thankful that your love does not respect borders, but it does spread from place to place, from person to person, bringing comfort, wholeness and hope. We pray a big prayer for all those around the world whose lives have been impacted by the virus. Lord, we pray for the world leaders. Please enable them to have compassion and a new vision for the future. We pray for our own government. Please guide their decisions as we gingerly step out of lockdown. Please continue to work alongside the medics scientists, farmers, hauliers and all the key workers and volunteers who have continued working even when they've been afraid or anxious all during this pandemic. Loving God, in this time of uncertainty and in our church, when we seem to be standing more on shifting sand rather than solid rock, with a familiar gone, hold us and all your churches in your love and grace. And we seek your Holy Spirit's guidance for the future. Dear Father, we pray for the strengthening of family life during the pressures of this pandemic. Please nurture the positive discoveries made by families who spent time in lockdown together but we also ask for healing in homes where there has been discord and heartache. Dear Lord, we pray for all who work or are connected to MHA. May they soon be able to restart their work in the community and in the MHA homes as they care for the sick. Please keep them in your loving embrace. Finally, Father, we pray for those we know who are struggling in various ways and we just hold them in our hearts in a moment's silence.
we pray for ourselves, knowing that we come to God who loves us. So Father, may our experiences and thoughts that we have encountered during the last year be seasoned with salt, full of grace, and be alive with hope. And we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Saviour, our risen Saviour. Amen. Amen. So a final blessing, let's pray. Lord God, go with us on our journey of faith. Revive us when we grow weary. Direct us when we go astray. Inspire us when we lose heart. Reprove us when we turn back. Keep us traveling ever onward, a pilgrim people looking to Jesus Christ, who has run the race before us. And so may the blessing of God, the Father Almighty, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with us now and evermore. Amen.